Well, good afternoon and welcome to the next in the series of webinars uh, hosted by me uh, from Romax. Uh, you're all welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. At uh, the bottom left hand side of your screen, there's a chat option. If you uh, do have any questions as we go through the webinar, please do feel free to type in. I'll do my very best to answer them whilst talking and typing. And I might have some assistance from a colleague of mine to uh, answer any issues you have. So today's webinar should last 25 minutes or so, and so we still get a chance of a bit of lunch. Uh, there are three parts to it. The uh, three elements are what is GDPR, a kind of overview, why it exists, what it's meant to do, and why it's been brought or being brought in. Um, some legal obligations, just to give you an idea of that. But obviously, I'm hoping the major large majority of you listening today will be uh, for the marketing background, so we're going to focus at the end on what the GDPR means to marketing. Um, I'm going to give you some of my opinions, I'm going to give you some of the TMA's opinions and the various industry viewpoints, and then we can perhaps have a chat over the uh, chat options at the bottom at the end. If there are any questions, do fire away. So, without further ado, the General Data Protection Regulation. What is it? Why is it? And what does it mean in a marketing context? Just in case anyone hasn't got the date in their diary, it is May the 25th. To some of you, it may come as a bit of a shock that uh, the rules around GDPR and the regulation actually already is law. And it only becomes enforceable on May the 25th. So just a little bit of background there for you. So we're already bound by it anyways. So why was GDPR um, introduced and, and what is the scope of it? The EU Commission um, some years ago, back in January 2012, uh, they wanted to basically update the data protection law. Um, they felt that there was a huge technological advance since the 1995 data protection di directive, uh, particularly around the marketing sector. The law didn't reflect current technologies or the developments that have you know, gone through leaps and bounds over the last 15, 20 years. And so the resulting um, kind of proliferation of data and the changing customer attitudes and expectations of your clients uh, towards how their data is looked at and managed, used, and felt that the law needed to be changed to reflect that. So that is the kind of scope, or the initial scope of why it's been brought in. The GDPR will directly affect everybody who's listening to this seminar if they're based uh, or their data has been processed, um, uh, personal data that is, of a U European Union citizen, uh, including those in the UK, Brexit apart. Uh, we'll perhaps touch towards Brexit, Brexit rather at the end if there's any questions relating to that. The regulation the GDPR regulation, and I will read this out now, and this regulation applies to the processing of personal data in the context of activities of an um, establishment of a controller or a processor in the European Union, regardless of whether the processing takes place in the Union or not. So what does that imply? That if we operate as a business or organisation within the European Union or the UK, then we're bound by it. The consequences of non-compliance, and there are a lot of high numbers banding around, and uh, so these, this is the fact. So the consequences of non-compliance are that four percent, if you don't comply and you're found to non-comply on a regular basis, and I'll come on to more about that in the few slides time, is four percent of your organization's worldwide turnover, or 20 million euros, whichever is the greater. Either of those is a large amount of uh, fine, which I'm sure none of us wish to be parting with. On top of the value of the cost implications, there's also the loss of the value of your brand and the long-term damage to your brand's reputation as a result of that. So uh, not only do you get a big slap on the wrist from your financial director, but um, your job's at risk because the brand that you represent is also taking a big hit. The Direct Marketing Association 
um, from which I borrowed these five key principles, um, actually reflects very closely what the GDPR is about. Those five key principles are, and I'll tell you why I'm listing these in a moment, put your customer first, respect their privacy and meet their, your customer's expectations, be honest and fair and be transparent, Exercise diligence with the data that you are responsible for, taking that responsibility, but being accountable and, and keeping a track of it. Now, those five key principles mirror the GDPR regulation and are a good doctor of five good doctrines to follow with GDPR in mind as to how you can change your marketing strategy to reflect these principles whilst uh, endorsing and following the GDPR regulations that are going to come into, well, they are in existence, but to come into enforcement on May 25th. Accountability and data security. Now this small aspect here is something to do with marketing, of course, but there's a large element of this that sometimes to brush over it to a degree and um, the responsibility of your IT team or your compliance teams within the organizations depending on the size of your organization as to whether you have a designated team or whether that falls onto the remit of uh, chief operating officer or the managing director or the head of data data someone in your organization will as point number four shows have to be the designated data protection officer it has to be recorded um, on documentation. It doesn't have to be submitted to the Information Commissioner's Office, but it has to be recorded so that if the worst case should happen, that DPO is known and can be uh, advised to those that it needs to be advised to. So each of these key ones where it relates to marketing, particularly your breach notification, will be uh, touched on a little bit more in a moment. Now, legitimate interest. This is one of the most uh, talked about areas in a marketing sphere um, over the last month or so, since it was released by the Information Commission's Office as to legitimate interest and how it can be used in the GDPR context in order to continue marketing to your contacts, clients, potential customers, etc. So the GDPR, the uh, way it describes legitimate interest, is the processing of personal data for direct marketing purposes. It may be regarded as carried out for a legitimate interest. Unless there's a lawyer listening, what that basically means is that if there is a genuine reason why the data subject that you hold in your database should continue to either receive information or indeed marketing from you, you can then contact them. There are a couple of caveats, so let's talk about those. Organisations are able to fall back on the term legitimate interest for data processing as long as they are continuing to adhere to future rules for GDPR. That sounds a little vague, so let me go into more detail. You can use legitimate interest for postal marketing, regardless of whether you have current pre-GDPR permissions to contact that person via post. Ideally, you would have, because previous directive says that you should have permission, but it, it was a little gray area where it's opt-in, opt-out. It has to be opt-in now, so let's just clarify that. Email to existing customers using the soft option option. So if someone has demonstrated that they wish to receive information through previous opt-in options, you can send them an email. There's a last thing at the bottom, telephone marketing. If they've not previously objected to you contacting them via the telephone and their number of the data subject is not listed on the telephone preference service, you may continue to do so. On all three of these elements, you must continue to allow the recipient of your marketing or communication to opt 
in to no further or opt out of no further communication at all times. You must make it clear, blatant and obvious why and how you're going to be using their data and allow them ease to which to change their uh, preferences. As long as you make the, the, the preference changing bold, obvious and easy to access, you can continue to do these three items of marketing until such time that the person opts out of receiving them. Content. I will read out what said uh, what the definition of GDP. Sorry, definition of consent is in GDPR terms. It's the consent of data subject. Consent of the, the data subject means any freely given, specific, informed, and unambiguous indication of the data subject's wishes, by which he or she, by a statement or by a clear affirmative action, signifies agreement to the processing of personal data relating to him or her. Again, in a nutshell, they have got to, they, being the data subject, have got to opt in under no duress with an unambiguous statement saying, we're going to use your data, please opt in to receive an email, opt in to receive a direct mail piece, opt in to receive a TM, a SMS or text, opt in to receive online information. Make it clear what the data subject is choosing. Something called a preference sensor, which I'll talk about a little bit further on, is a perfect example of how to give your potential clients the choice. So obtaining, obtaining consent is, is, is vital now. You must make it clear as to what they're opting in for and how they are opting to receive that information online, electronic, etc. So the who, what, where and how summarizes that. Who is it that's opting in? What are they opting in to in terms of communication? What levels and, and what is it marketing? Is it just general business communication relevant to their membership or relevant to their um, interaction with you as a business, be it uh, insurance documents, things like that? Where they receive it and how they receive it. That's based on the media by which that communication is sent, be <clears throat> it's printed, electronic. Whether they go to a portal of their own choice to access it without um, proactive communication coming from you is their option too. That is a limiting factor from a marketing perspective, but it still allows you to market to them within that portal environment should they log on to that. Once you've obtained their consent by whatever means, you must record it and date stamp it. Most of these, these days will be captured either through an electronic database uh, when someone checks a, a checkbox and that records it and date stamps it into a back end database behind the website. However, you've got call centers, queries, and sometimes they'll be caught into recording the calls and that people have opted in to receive it if they've been asked verbally. And there are, uh, you can at a very, very basic level, write down the date that someone asked X, Y, and Z, and that will, as a verbal contract, is backed up by writing. The most important thing is that you keep a, an audit trail, not necessarily a paper trail, but an audit trail of when your data subject opted in or out of certain communications, or certain channels of communication, and each of those occasions that they show a preference must be recorded as the most recent. So someone could, over a course of a six month period, opt in, opt out, opt back in again, and you have to record every single one of those because it is only viable at the time that they have, so you have to follow their requests most recently. But this is where a, I might be jumping the gun slightly here, but this is where a data policy, which you make available to your data subjects on an online medium, for example, shows how, where, and how often you will be updating it. So for example, if they make a change today, but you've already extracted data for communication last week, you say to them, 
please allow up to X working days for changes to become to filter through to uh, to become the, the new true record. Okay, the data breach. Heaven forbid that anyone hacks in or there's someone leaves a, an unprotected um, USB stick or uh, they send an, an email with data attached that's not password protected or they don't use a secure FTP site to transfer data and somebody gets hold of that data. That is a, that is a data breach. Now the notification of such a breach is to the Information Commissioner's Office is mandatory unless it, it, there is an unlikely to result in the risk to rights and freedoms of individuals. I would suggest very strongly that should a data breach occur, excluding simply name and address perhaps, but anything that includes any other personal information at all, that you contact the ICO and ask report it, be open about it and say, we believe this situation has happened. We'd like to tell you the extent of it. What do you recommend we do by the law? They will then make a recommendation to us as such. It is better to be open and transparent and clear rather than try and sweep it under the carpet, which is an absolute no-no, and hope that it goes away, because it won't. The data controller, that is the person whose data, who owns that data. Now, ultimately, the GDPR implies that the data subjects, it's their data, they own it. You are controlling it and you're using it for your own purposes, potentially, under the authority of that data subject. So as a data controller, the person who originally would have been the data owner, you must, if there is a data breach, notify the Information Commissioner's Office within 72 hours or, as a safeguard, without undue delay detailing those points I've made there. Just as an aside, copies of this webinar will be sent out to everybody via email at the end. These points listed here should be clearly included in your data policy around GDPR so that, again, you have a go-to document with all the information commissioner's office contact details, who your data protection officer is, etc., etc., checked and updated every six to 12 months at least, and that document is ready at all times so that you can act on it. So once this breach has been notified and there's a reason, an absolute reason, and you've been told perhaps by the ICO or it's quite clear that you need to communicate with the, uh, the data subjects that have had their data breached or shared outside of its normal use, then you've got to communicate to them. The four points you have to tell them about is the nature of the breach, i.e. Who, who's got it and how it occurred, what the likely knock-on effects of that are to them, who your data protection officer is, and you need to give as a minimum their name, but I would strongly recommend that you have their name, contact center, and some detail that they that, that worried or concerned data subjects that you have a responsibility for can phone in and get questions. Uh, questions answered and uh, within that the last point within that communication is to detail to the data subjects who've been affected what they should do to mitigate the risk of their data being used inappropriately you can't foresee what that would be until you know what's been stolen if you like or breached where the data's been breached but or even potentially breached so you have to have available within a couple of days or ideally 12 to 24 hours somebody who is responsible to make a decision within your organization as to what actions should be taken within the law to make sure that you not only do the right thing by the GDPR's data breach requirement but reduce the damage or damage the reduce damage limitation basically to those people who've been affected it's better to be open and transparent rather the sun or the times picking up on something and making you the worst marketing manager in the world or the worst data protection team in the world they will blow it 
not necessarily out of proportion, but they will give you false representation beyond the front foot. Okay, the rights of the data subjects. Now, a data subject is obviously a data record on your database. I'm not going to read those out. There are indeed very many um, rights, not only the rights to be informed, which are multiple, like um, what the data subject is allowed to ask, but in a, in a nutshell, as a data subject yourself, you are entitled to phone up anybody who you know or suspect is holding your data and ask them to tell you exactly how it's stored, where it's stored. Is it stored in the UK? How often is it used for? Do you use it for profiling? Do you use it for any form of communication? What records do you hold against me and what information do you have against me? Within that data record, I would like to see it, please. You cannot refuse that. Profiling the GDPR. As marketers, and this is where we start to talk about the impact of the GDPR on us as, a, as an industry. The current data protection directive, first of all, did not have a definition of profiling. And as a result, allowed profiling to be used and, and, and unchecked by us and policed by us to our own advantage as marketeers. So in effect, if, if, if I've got a Ford Focus and it's five years old with my insurance up to date and I have five kids and two dogs, they can use all that information to promote to me without my consent up until now. So the GDPR defines it differently. Again, I won't read that out. It's, uh, it's for you to read in your good time later. But in effect, it seriously reduces um, the use of that data to be profiled unless you have received absolute um, authority by them opting in for them to use it or them the right to opt out without, of you using it without a doubt. When you're planning your next marketing campaign, and only 50% or less perhaps of your database is allowing you to use their information that you have captured from them through the interactions with you through purchasing and every other means that you talk with them. The limitations that that implies are huge. Unless you have 2 million people on the database of which 1 million allow you to profile, you still get quite a good cohort there to, 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 to make an opinion on. If you've got 40,000, that only allows 20,000 of your cohort to be judged, your profiling is becoming more limited as a result. I see this as a quite a large barrier to clever marketing in the future, but I'm sure that the ICO and over time, your data subjects will actually see the benefits of how profiling helps them. And this is one of the key things that as marketers we need to do. Instead of saying, oh, we're, we're spying on these uh, data subjects, we're using them to our own advantage and we know exactly who they are, what they are, and what we think they should be entitled to receive from us. What we should do is turn that on its head through a preference centre, ask the individual concerned exactly what they would like to receive in their opinion, or parameters around things that they may wish to receive. Are you interested in automobiles rather than just a specific type of car. Are you interested in sport? Now that allows all kinds of um, an extended cohort to be included. As long as you communicate that to them, that you're going to use it for that type of um, marketing profile, remembering to allow them the opportunity to opt out as they wish, that can actually work in your favor because the people who are fully engaged are saying yes, Give me everything you've got, I want to know all about it. And the ones who aren't truly engaged, you may not be spending quite as much with you. you probably opt away from that option. So, softly, softly, what do I mean by this? The ICO have made it very, very clear that they are going to operate in a pragmatic way with relation to GDPR in every one of its 
uh, remits across all data use. And that applies obviously very strongly in a marketing context. They're not looking out to get you. I don't think they're looking to make an example of anybody. They would think they'd rather it just came into force, everybody abided by it and adapted to it and made it work. What's important to remember is that someone's going to make a mistake. The ICO will not come down like a sledgehammer on that individual or individual organization. They will ask for an audit trail. They'll ask to say, what have you done with your data? Why have you done this? And, and what's happened? So if there is a complaint by one or multiple data subjects, as long as you have a clear policy and a data audit and can demonstrate good or best practice with the best intention of your marketing, they will not penalize you. You might suffer some embarrassment from the data subjects and their, their immediate cohorts, but you will be given the right by the ICO to remedy the, the incidents and make it good. They certainly won't be looking to do that on May the 26th. They will allow people a, a good period of time. They haven't set out a, an exact date period, but they, they will allow a gray period over which they understand people are going to be adapting and changing the way they operate. The flip side of that is the data subjects may expect instant change on some sides, and you need to be prepared to um, discuss that with them and, and make sure that it was compliant as possible on May 25th. But most importantly, you need to carry on marketing. So staying legal, following a data policy, the things I just touched on, have them all ready and to safeguard you and to follow that guidance as you move through. So what should be included in your communication between now and May the 25th and after that grey area after the 25th of May? Well, and this is largely my opinion, but it's the opinion that I've, I've gathered over the few months, of, not a few, the many months, uh, that we've been working on GDPR and, and, and as it comes close to the, the go of the enhancement deadline, the enforcement deadline. But most importantly, I have to freely admit I have changed our outlook and our recommendation to our clients and how we'll be dealing with this in the last four to six weeks from what I understood it to be 12 months ago. So, for example, we were considering and we made to have had discussions about up to the May the 20th, May, April the 25th to send out very clear communication about GDPR, what you're going to be doing about it and how you're going to enforce it and asking people to opt in and do all those things. Now that is not necessarily a bad thing, it depends on your, your market audience. I think a better way of doing it is to start following the legal guidelines for GDPR now in terms of allowing people choice, demonstrating their options, talking about GDPR in an open and transparent way, but not asking people to immediately drop out in a, in a letter. If I sent you a letter saying you must now comply with GDPR for roadmap marketing, fill in this questionnaire now, you're going to feel a degree of pressure, the marketing message is going to be removed, you're going to either do it immediately and just go, no, 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 I don't want it. Or you might mean to do it and never get around to it. By doing it on a softly, softly approach, you get your, doc your communications right, you continue your marketing across whichever media you use, and have clear instructions as to what you're going to be using their data for. Start building that uh, collateral of GDPR, GDPR communication uh, tools, your preference sensors, getting the database and recording and your audit trails in place so that if they're not already, so that your data subjects can say, do you know what, I know GDPR is coming, they're telling me it's coming, they're reminding me in a soft way that I can now have choice if I wish to have more information, contact us. It's another good way of them, you having another interaction point with your member stroke clients. So how do you stay in touch with those? I've touched on preference centers. What is a preference center? It can be, it's ideally a, um, 
a database of your members, but most likely going to be a web portal which is available to you, to, to them, through your website, to you, through your call centers, to you, through your admin teams, where you can not only see a customer's preference center, but you allow them the opportunity to change their preferences. And you can use that as a briefly touched on earlier to sub market to them and say welcome to preference center would you like options on this this and this this is why we think you should opt into it it's a subtle way of asking them to do it they still don't have to do it and they're still opting in you're not pressurizing them to do it you're saying that this is an advantage as to why you may wish a key one a key one a key message to get across today is to review the entire organization that you work for with a view to how you see customers or the communication to those customers does it suit you the way you communicate or are you suiting them in the way you communicate how do you flip it on its head how would you like to receive your communication do you ever have an absolute aversion to email do you have an absolute aversion to direct mail do you sit somewhere in between depending on who you're you're interacting with when you place an order on Amazon do you just want an email receipt you don't need a written postal receipt I just want an app confirmation that I placed an order every single interaction touch point has a different requirement based on the customer not only on that day but what they're buying how quickly they're buying it and what it's for I can't tell you how that works for your organization but what I can suggest is that you allow the choice you allow people to say via phone via text only and every possible combination of that you offer to allow them that choice so hopefully I've given some advice which has been useful that the overview here is sufficient to allow you to make a next step if you haven't already done that but if you are still a little confused first of all I understand that GDPR takes some months to get your head around and as the um, the absolute interpretation of the regulations has not been finalized even by the ICO as yet it's understandable that we as marketeers and particularly compliance teams have been working until very recently a little blind and in the dark as to what's to be required I think that understanding now is more clear um, I certainly understand it. my team here understands it we can help you to interpret that more but uh, an, an, an analogy that we've been using internally is to look at it as a holiday you're going on holiday on a certain date let's call it May the 25th you know what you intend to do after that point you know there's going to be an itinerary you know you want to go on a certain tour you know you want to sit by the pool for a couple of days you know what time you leave you know what time you come back you know you're going to need a passport the audit trail the data protection policy the data protection officer these are all the things you need to get in place prior to the holiday but you have to be prepared to be flexible while you're on holiday there may be delays there may be all kinds of unforeseen things that prevent you following it to the letter as long as you keep a track of that on an audit trail with your data protection in mind and make good and demonstrate how you're going to improve process rather than just ignoring process you'll be in a strong position should the very worst happen and a breach occurs thank you very much for listening today the GDPR is a very complicated subject and I've tried to make it as uncomplicated as possible while getting the key points across. I hope that has been the case. I open the floor, so to speak, to any questions that anybody may have. As I did touch on before, we will be sending out copies of the webinar to everybody who very kindly attended today. So thank you very much to those who have attended um, I hope you enjoy the sunshine uh, outside it's a lovely time of a spring day you get a little bit of time away from your desk and you go and have a, a, a lovely lunch if there are any questions relating to GDPR 
please do contact myself and my team offline. More than happy to discuss it with you. Um, client, not client, future client, it, it's irrelevant to us. We're just um, happy to talk about GDPR and, and what that means to a marketing context. I'm just watching the thank yous for everyone. That's very kind of you. Thank you very much to all you two. No questions seem to be coming through. I take that from two ways. Either it's a fantastic uh, webinar and I've answered everybody's question, or you can't wait to get off the webinar and go for lunch. I won't take it either way, but I will thank you very much for Oh, I had to see a question just come through. Let me answer that. So the question is, if someone buys a ticket to an event, we are unable to use legitimate interest to contact them via email for similar events, or is it via the soft option? That would be the soft opt-in option, in my opinion. Um, if it's a similar event, then you may well use legitimate interest. But by similar, it has to be a similar genre or perhaps the same artist. So there's some, some doubt about that. My recommendation would be that when they're making the booking for that ticket, you make it clear on a preference choice, would you like more information about this genre or this particular artist or this particular event or type of sport? I hope that answers your question, Stephen. Thank you. I can see any more questions coming through. Okay, well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining myself today. I'd like to thank Dan Milda, my marketing manager, for her work and help putting this together. Have a lovely day, and we look forward to hearing from you offline if you'd like to contact us. All the very best.